We just ended a rare triple dip La Nina pattern, meaning three La Nina years in a row. That's only happened three other times. And now most forecasts agree we're headed into an El Nino phase. What is an El Nino and why some think we could be headed towards a super El Nino and why what happens in the waters of the Pacific thousands of miles away from the US has such an impact on global weather patterns, including affecting things like this, the Galapagos penguin. First, we have to define what El Nino and La Nina are. They're basically opposites of each other. The boy versus the girl in Spanish. Now, in a La Nina pattern, which we were in, we have abnormally cold water off the eastern Pacific, the west coast of South America. El Nino is just the opposite. We get into warmer than normal water. Now, this all starts due to the circulation of the planet and surface winds, and it all starts here with the warming towards the equator at a place we call the Intertropical Convergence Zone. Just a fancy way of saying, where's the hot belt around the planet? The sun heats that up, you get thunderstorms to form because it's the tropics, and what goes up must come down. And where that air comes down again, then flows out in all directions. And because of Earth's rotation, all of these winds start to curve. And we get what's called the trade winds that blow from northeast to southwest in the northern hemisphere and from southeast to southwest in the southern hemisphere. This pushes the water in the Pacific westward. And that means we get upwelling off the coast of South America, meaning water has to come in from the bottom, the depths. It's very cold, nutrient-rich water. Cold water holds more oxygen and nutrients. And then that water pushes westward and is heated up by the hot tropical sun along the equator towards the tropical Pacific. This is why as you head towards Australia, Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, the water there is always very warm. Now in a typical La Nina pattern, or even in a normal pattern, a neutral pattern, you get this colder water off the coast of South America, and then the warm water accumulates to the west. La Nina is just amplifying that pattern, making it even stronger than normal conditions. Now in an El Nino situation, those trade winds break down or even reverse direction. That means the warm water kind of backs up and you get thunderstorms to develop more in the central and eastern Pacific instead of way to the west. This has huge implications for global circulation because now the air is sinking and coming down in different areas. So in a La Nina pattern, those thunderstorms are way to the west towards Australia, Indonesia, the western tropical Pacific, and not much going on in the eastern Pacific. But when we reverse that, we get into El Nino phase, that all backs up. We get the warm water in the central and eastern Pacific all along the equator and thunderstorms developing in the central part of the Pacific Ocean. This affects global circulations. You get those large dominant high pressures in different spots, low pressures and storminess in other areas. It affects the jet stream and everything else. So this is looking at literally the last several months. Cold water in the eastern Pacific, La Nina phase, the warm water accumulating to the west, but it's been breaking down We've been seeing a, a switch to a neutral phase now with warmer water off the uh, east coast or the west coast of South America, the eastern tropical Pacific. You have that accumulation of warm water to the west, but it's starting to move eastward. We're starting to see the breakdown of that La Nina pattern into a neutral phase or potentially uh, an El Nino phase. And what the effects of it on North America and globally are the opposite, basically. So La Nina, typical patterns, cooler weather from Alaska through Canada into the upper Midwest. We get dry conditions in the South, opposite in an El Nino phase. We get literally warmer than normal conditions from Alaska through the Pacific Northwest into the upper Midwest. And we get into a stormy wet pattern in the South from Southern California through Texas, the Southern US with kind of a mixed bag of things here uh, on the East Coast and influences. That Pacific jet stream really gets energized with more moisture because the moisture is closer to North America in El Nino phase. One of the consequences too, not only is it warmer for the upper Midwest, but we see way less snowfall than normal, but areas to the South see an uptick in overall precipitation, but also the chances of seeing at least a little bit of snow. And the patterns have global impacts too. Namely, Australia gets really bad droughts as we head into an El Nino phase, but also parts of Africa can get into some pretty severe droughts too. And of course that can affect crops, famine, fires like we saw several years ago in Australia that killed off a lot of wildlife, but there are also implications in North America and the Galapagos, which sits right on the equator, in fact, and is right in the middle of this El Nino-La Nina phase. This is a Galapagos penguin, the only penguin to live at the equator, the farthest north penguin 
to live. But they live in an area that's pretty precarious. And when those waters warm up, you get into an El Nino phase, we see crashes in the population because the water holds less nutrients. That means there's less fish and the penguins just can't survive. When we have these super El Ninos, we've seen really big crashes in the population in the early 80s and then again in the late 90s. And that's because the Galapagos is a basically a giant volcano in the Eastern Pacific with those trade winds blowing east to west that creates that upwelling. You get on the west side of the islands, cold, nutrient-rich water, and this is why the penguins live on the western sides of those islands. But when that pattern breaks down, the entire food web breaks down as well. Now we have to talk about something, the super El Ninos that I just mentioned. That's when we get El Ninos that are even warmer than normal El Ninos. So warmer than that half a degree Celsius above normal. And all this is complicated by the fact that we are warming up our planet. This is looking at the heat in the oceans. It has been warming up a lot. In fact, we think 70% of the extra heat we're putting into the planet is being absorbed so far by the oceans. So that means when El Ninos get going, they're stronger, and we're potentially increasing the frequency and probability of super El Ninos, which we have been seeing here recently. The last one was 2015, 2016. Before that was the late 90s, and then before that was the early 80s. Now, the official probability forecast from NOAA for El Nino is that we head into likely El Nino territory by the late summer and fall. They're not forecasting a super El Nino yet. That's not even an official definition. It's just what forecasters use when we get past that two degrees Celsius mark. But when we look at the, all the different models, we have lots of models just like we do for hurricanes or any storm, they increasingly are getting towards that two degrees or warmer Celsius in the El Nino area that we watch. And there's been a change since late March to recent where more of those models are getting in that hotter territory. And we already know that Earth's oceans just set a record. The last record before this one was during 2016's major El Nino because El Nino brings heat that's in the depths to the surface and that affects global surface temperatures. So a strong El Nino this year could make 2024 the warmest year we've seen yet. That happened in 2016. And before that, it happened in 1998 with those super El Ninos. Will that put us past that 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming? As I mentioned, the last hottest year was 2016, a super El Nino, and before that was 1998. So whether we reach super El Nino or just regular El Nino, these El Nino patterns are getting supercharged with climate change.